Hello everyone, I'm Audrey Kanahian and today I'm going to talk about one of the world's most interesting mega project that was conducted in Kansai International Airport. This was a, a part of my course Advanced Geomechanics. This is a review paper presentation on settlement of Kansai International Airport Island paper. So first of all, uh, Kansai International Airport is considered one of the most engineering, mar one of the most interesting engineering marvel because this was not conducted on land. This was conducted on reclaimed land five kilometers away from the, off, uh, from the shore of Osaka Bay. And uh, the name of the sea was Seto Inland Sea in situated in Osaka Basin. And this, uh, project was designed by Renzo Piano. The working of this project started in 1994. Actually, there were two phases that the uh, operation started. First one is in 1994. And after the completion of the second island, which is an extension of the airport, the airport finally fully started functioning from 2007. This is one of the most interesting projects because it changed the fact that uh, what could be done in engineering uh, perspective and what was possible, it changed the total fact. And uh, Hong Kong International Airport and many other airports were inspired from this airport and they built their airports on reclaimed land. Before this construction, no one has ever constructed something so big and uh, something so deep uh, in the sea, uh, reclaiming their land. So this project was a milestone project for uh, engineering of the world. And this project was awarded for complex geotechnical designing in various designing programs. So I would like to talk about the whole airport just a bit. The airport is five kilometer away from the shore and Mm, and island one is around 50, 511 hectare, which is a depth of 18 meter. And island two is around 445 hectare, which is a depth of 20 meter. This island is surrounded by mountains. As we can see, it has Roku Mountains on the north and uh, Izumi Mountains on the south and east. It has Ikomo and Kongo Mountains. Under, to better understand the airport, we need to first understand the geology of the uh, <clears throat> Osaka Bay. So first of all, the bed level of Osaka Bay is projected here. And here we can see that uh, the place where the airport was built, it was around 1,000 to 400 uh, seabed level depth. So we, there are various layers of soils in the seabed of Osaka layer, and it is not in, built in one day. It was built through uh, global climate change and relative sea level changes in this place. And volcanic activity also played an important role in changing the, to making those individual layers, those couple of layers. And here, uh, the maximum weight, the maximum height of the uh, depth of the Osaka Bay is around 3000 meter, which can be seen in the center of this. Again, if we see then the soil layer seabed, uh, here is the soil profile of the seabed. And this is the cross section in this way. And we can see here that uh, here are around 19 clay layers and uh, 19 sand layers and 22 clay layers. Uh, and in this section also, there are a lot of layers of sand and clay. Usually it's like a, a change of layer. Like first it's gonna be clay, then it's gonna be sand, then it's gonna be clay, then it's gonna be sand. And um, usually four types of sand were found here. One is Pleistocene marine clay, which is denoted as MA0 to MA12. Holocene marine clay, which is denoted as MA13. Sand layers from DS1 to DS10. And non-marine clay, which are represented as DOC and NMC. So we can see that the borehole uh, here went up to 400. And here also it went up to 400. 
so we will talk about a bit later about the boreholes. So the construction of uh, Kansa International Airport were taken place in four stages. The very first stage was uh, clearing the drainage path. So for that reason, vertical drains were uh, used before installing vertical lane a uh, five foot sand layer were installed here we can see above the clay layer there is a white pore portion this is actually denoted by the sand layer and after that vertical sand drains were installed those uh, vertical sand drains were around 48 centimeter in diameter and mechanically they were inputted into the ma13 uh, clay layer soil which is the very first layer of the soil and then the, after some time, the vertical uh, sand drains were taken out and sand columns were created. The basic reason of this creation was uh, creating drainage path through, path through sand columns. And this actually uh, increased the drainage path through sand columns. And the second phase of construction was construction of seawall. After the sand drains were vertically implanted, um, then a sea wall was built around the uh, around the airport so that construction will not be harmed. And after that, reclamation of the airport island was taken place. Around four thirty million cube of uh, fill materials were used. They were shipped through large boats to the. Uh, uh, to the required station and then uh, this way the la land were reclaimed and finally the airport facility was constructed over the landfill reclamation island one used around um, 180 million cube of uh, landfill and island two used around 250 million cube of landfill and these landfills were uh, taken from 10 to 25 kilometer near the airport area so background, uh, now we have to know why this was constructed on a reclaimed land instead of the land. Because uh, before also, uh, they had uh, some issues when they tried, when you know, Japanese tried to create the Itami and Nartistia airports and uh, to avoid those uh, collisions with public people and maintain the state of peace, they had to build up uh, an airport which does not disturb the residence area through their noise pollution or they don't have to uh, take away anyone's land and finally compensations were given to the, given to the fishermen of Osaka Bay to uh, uh, so that they their work won't be harmed and uh, they can find a new way for their living and the objective of this report is uh, reporting settlement analysis of Kansai International Airport so first there were seabed investigation and for the seabed investigation, 63 boreholes were installed for around 100 to 200 meter and 6,000 uh, and six 400 meter borings were made to understand the soil properties. And through these uh, data, uh, through these data, soil properties were determined. The picture that we are seeing here about the soil layers, it was actually made from these bore log data. So water content, uh, water content relationship was also first of all analyzed with these. Um, here we can see that it's determined for MA13 and MA10. And for MA13 water content, liquid limit and plastic limit uh, all decreases with the increase in depth. Here Z is the depth of, uh, from where we're taking the soil and L is the length of uh, thickness. So Z by L is actually taken so that we can compare the results. And uh, for MA10, as the distance increases, water content decreases, uh, increases first and then decreases at a certain point. This can be understand, understood through the drainage conditions that were, that were created with sand, uh, sand drain. And then permeability and compressibility was checked in the seabed level. So in permeable, for permeability, no direct test was 
conducted instead of direct test uh, mercy's equation was used to de determine uh, permeability various kind various numbers of permeability were first uh, suggested and finally in 2005 10 to the power minus 5 and 8.5 into 10 to the power minus 5 for sand layers were considered and ds1 to ds10 these were the sand layers and they were uh, considered as functioning drainage layers and permeability of clay layer was back calculated to a program named ILICOM. And for compressibility, particle, uh, it was determined through the effective particle stress, increased loading and uh, from strain odometer test, it was also determined. And finally, these inputs of stress were used uh, in ILICON program to determine the early of primary void ratio and vertical stress relationship. Here we can uh, see the depth below seabed and effective stress change. So as the depth increases, the effective vertical stress also increases. So the problem occurred when the settlement started. The surface uh, soft elevation of uh, Kansai airport was supposed to be four meter above the sea level. Uh, engineers before their prediction knew that this was gonna settle, but this, settled more than they assumed or more than they calculated. As of December 2012, we can see that um, the settlement exceeded 12.9, 14.2 meter for island one and two respectively. And we can see that the trend of uh, settlement and the visual uh, observation of settlement, uh, the settlement was more than what was actually predicted through the ILICON program, but then with time around 2004, we can see that observed points are less than the uh, actual settlement, uh, observed points are less than the model settlements. This was because uh, when the settlement continuously took place, they used to add more earth materials to the uh, landfilling reclamation, uh, to the landfill reclamation and the settling uh, kind of slowed down for the process. And this is for MP1 of uh, uh, island one, and this is the measuring point one for island two. And here uh, for all of the soil layers, we can see that the settlement is, uh, settlement is around, uh, we see that uh, almost observed and uh, observed and model value are similar here because the settlement here actually uh, slowed down because of the increase in the seabed level that people actually uh, inserted soil earth into that place. So finally, for conclusion, there were many things that was found from this. Uh, some of uh, them are, uh, it had, in the island two has 22 clay layers with a height of 290 meter and 19 sand layers with a height of 110 meters and different sort of boring. Uh, we have already talked about the borings and vertical permeability for plasticine clay and holocene clay was also determined. And clay permeability was back calculated. And then uh, EOP, E log sigma relationship was also determined through this. And another interesting thing is uh, EOP value was considered to be unique for both a uh, lab test and for land test, but through this, we can see that whatever we test on the lab, I mean, the settlement that we get from the lab is not always exactly unique to the uh, <clears throat> actual settlement. So actually this creates a doubt of question about the uniqueness of EOPE log sigma V not relationship and primary consolidation. Uh, yeah, primary consolidation was uh, soon realized. And by 2021, the settlement is given. It is, Assume that by 2067 or sooner, island one will be at sea level and 2058 and 2100, island two will be at sea level. Though we could not conclude, uh, though we could not uh, conclude a way to actually save this settlement or stop the settlement, this is not possible. But I would still like to say that this is one of the most marvelous and daring engineering project that was conducted ever in art. And, uh, the settlement that we are facing here uh, is also because we are adding more land reclamation, which is also causing more settlement. Uh, 
but we can learn from this and have more experiments going on why this settlement is more than we expected and then we can uh, again construct something newer and we can have our mankind more progressed thank you everyone for your time